Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, Artists in Conversation. I am Laura Smith. I'm the Director of Collection and Exhibitions at the Hepworth Wakefield in Yorkshire, the UK. And I am thrilled to welcome artist Emma Tolbert to the programme today. Before we begin, I'm going to read out a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this programme will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the programme. We will be using a Q&A featured on your navigation bar to gather, you to gather your questions for Emma and they will be answered at the end of the programme. But please feel free to submit any questions at any time. If you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking the icon on your navigation bar. I'd also like to read a land acknowledgement from Yale University and the Yale Centre for British Art, who acknowledge that Indigenous people and nations have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honour and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and the nations and, and this land. So on to introducing Emma Talbot. Uh, Emma Talbot was born in Stourbridge, Worcestershire in the UK. She works primarily in animation, drawing, painting and sculpture. Her work often articulates internal narratives through visual poems or associative reflections based on her own experiences and memories. Her practice considers complex issues such as eco-politics in the natural world, feminist theory and storytelling, as well as questions regarding our relationship to communication language and technology. In 2020, Emma won the Max Maurer Art Prize for Women, a project established by Whitechapel Gallery, Gallery London, Max Maurer, the Fashion House, and Collezioni Marimotti in Reggio Emilia. The exhibition she created, which I had the privilege to curate with her when I was a curator at Whitechapel Gallery, was based on the painting Three Ages of Women, 1905 by Gustav Klimt. Emma lives and works in London and Italy. And you're joining us from Italy today, right, Emma? Yeah, yeah. It's nice to be with you. And thank you to Yale Centre for British Art for the invitation. Uh, so let's begin the Q&A. Um, I'm going to skip through the slides. So let me know if I'm going too fast or if you want to go forward or back to anything. Uh, and I thought, as I said in the introduction, the issues that you deal with in your work are complex and vital. They're informed by feminist theory, storytelling, eco-politics, and our relationship to technology and nature. So I thought perhaps we could use different projects of yours to elaborate on some of these themes, starting with your incredible commission for the Venice Biennale in 2022, and that project's specific exploration of our relationship with nature. Yeah. We've got an image of it, haven't we? Yeah. So there, there were there were two um, pieces of work in the the Milk of Dreams, which was the um, Biennale exhibition curated by Cecilia Alemani. And um, when I was speaking to Cecilia about the idea of making some work for the exhibition, and she was explaining to me this kind of incredible concept for this very comprehensive exhibition while we were talking the title um where do we come from what are we where are we going just came into my head and usually if i have a, a sort of an idea that just pops into my head like that i really try to hold on to it because i think um quite often intuitive thoughts are quite useful for me and it's the title of uh, a Gauguin painting, which um, was made in 1897, I think. And he made it in Tahiti, where he'd sort of self-exiled. Um, and the, the painting he made, I wasn't interested in uh, re uh, reimagining or remaking his painting, but I really thought these three questions, these are, are the sort of basic existential questions that, you know, really form our, our sort of uh, consideration of what, what are we as human? And that seemed to really attach really perfectly to the things that Cecilia and I were talking about, about 
human relationships with nature and uh, a sense of, you know, the questioning of like what it is to be human. And um, these three meditations that Gurgan um, had learned as a child seemed to me to provide a kind of temporal sense of, you know, across a painting that I would make that would be this kind of format, it's a kind of curved format in the space would be, although, you know, I don't think of my work as linear, I think of it as something that you accrue by looking at, you accrue the meaning by looking at the work and there's no sort of one direction to look at it. But um, the idea that Gauguin was looking for a way to escape from industrialized Paris when he wanted to go to Tahiti, he thought of it as this kind of um, sort of pure, um, sort of natural space. But when he arrived there, he realized it was corrupted already. And um, I was thinking that we as humans have a kind of tendency to think of nature, natural spaces as spaces to escape to. And we, we sort of don't think about how much we corrupt the space of nature and how much we are sort of destructive. Um, and so the painting was like the idea of a storm being in a storm and exploring these kinds of temporal ideas of, you know, just what we are as humans and the histories that we've built up and the kinds of um, empires and then broken kind of previous cultures that we sort of base our contemporary uh, sense of self uh, and community and society on. And then our desire to reconnect with nature, which is very prevalent contemporaneously. And then at the end of the, the one end of the painting, there was this sort of blue figure, which was like an avatar. And it's the idea of, I don't think you can see it in this image, but it was the idea of us imagining a kind of escape as if we can escape into AI, into technology, or as if we might be able to escape to another planet at this point, because we have these kinds of projects. Um, and I, I sort of, in the text, described humans as these kinds of parasites that jump from host to host. So it's like the, a human condition to want to survive, but at, at almost any cost. And that's really, within the, the, the painted hanging, there are lots of kinds of thoughts and considerations in these texts but it, it really is quite a complex set of ideas because you know I this kind of idea in a uh, relationship with nature is it's not simple it's very layered um, and then the three-dimensional work that you saw just now is also attached to that they, they sort of are in relationship with each other these two pieces of work at one end of a platform, there's a figure that sort of grabs onto, holds onto a snake as if they're, they're holding onto this kind of living energy in order to give birth, this sort of extraordinary, sort of extraordinarily forceful um, physical act of giving birth that summons up this kind of natural energy. And at the other end of the platform is this sort of, again, a kind of blue avatar-like figure that is standing on this snake and it's as if uh they're the the human that thinks it's superhuman thinks also that it's in control of nature and thinks that it's in control a sort of um above above everything in terms of its ability to control things but that's not realistic and uh between them is this kind of net which is like either the idea of a natural net or something very digital, this kind of idea of a separation between physical and digital. Um. <laughs> With the snakes, were you thinking at all about um, uh, kind of Christianity and original sin and the serpent in the Garden of Eden? No, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking of that, but I was thinking uh, of the snake as a kind of um, a form or this idea of like when we take elements from the natural world and then we use them as symbols, we kind of reduce the natural world into a set of signs. And the idea that the snake could be sort of used as, you know, it's used in a kind of um, 
the sign for uh, a doctor, a medical sign. It's used, it's kind of reduced into a sort of symbol for us. And we do that with nature. We take elements of nature and we sort of repurpose them. Um, but at the same time, the snake was really in the 3D work, the snake was really a sort of physical representation of the, this idea of something living in nature, something that has this kind of power and potential and that nature isn't this very pure, safe space for us. It's also threatening and it can be dangerous. And, you know, the idea that we're in somehow in control of it is, is a, a fiction and the snake seems like a very good to me, a very good way of describing that. But, but in terms of religious symbolism, it, it isn't something I was thinking of or I wanting. With those appropriations of us, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I guess the other thing about, um, yeah, these are some of, some of the panels, these sort of details of some of the panels. And the other the other thing about the three dimensional work there was that um, some of the surfaces of the three dimensional figures were digitally knitted. So this this idea of the, the very handmade and this very sort of technological process of making a surface. So you get these kind of combinations of the of natural materials like the willow in the in the net, and then other things which are sort of very sort of um, advanced in terms of the technology of making. Mm -hmm. Thinking about um, the dangers of nature and, and naturally occurring um, phenomenon, it was just as we were starting to emerge from COVID and the and the lockdown that you were making the exhibition that I just skipped onto Ghost Calls at DCA in Dundee in Scotland. Yeah which uh, this work, so I, I was wanted to move on to it because this work was for me much more about that relationship with technology and the digital, um, as well as kind of looking back to ancient rituals and ancient ways of dealing with grief and mourning. Yeah. Um, could you tell can us a bit? Can we look at the next slide so I can show you something that at the beginning of like the entrance of the the show was this hanging, which is a crash in fast and slow motion. And it was made, you know, at that time of the pandemic and the idea of all of our systems kind of stopping everything that was part of, a, you know, the way that we lived without really thinking very much about it had suddenly crashed. And I was thinking of this sort of screwed up, crashed world. It's like a sort of not a particular vehicle or something, you know, that specific that's crashed, but these figures are sort of clambering out of a, a crash situation. It's the first thing you saw and you couldn't move beyond, you know, you can walk around it, but you couldn't avoid seeing it. And then after that, we could go back to the previous image. After that was this idea of um, a landscape, which is based on thinking about a Scottish landscape, a mountainous Scottish landscape. And um, I was thinking about um, a sort of uh, uh, an experience of, you know, the, the, the pandemic showing to us what it's like if things just aren't the same as they were before. They're attached to that is a kind of grief, a kind of grief in terms of thinking about how things were. It's like you're forced to start thinking about missing something or you know, how things were before. And then that the process of grief is actually a process of acceptance, accepting that things won't be the same as they were before. And then in um, um, Celtic tradition, in Scottish and Irish tradition, there were these uh, professional mourners who were called keeners. And I like the idea of a group of women who were professional mourners who would guide the viewer through this landscape and the landscape as a container, which has been there for all time, which has seen everything, all of the, the kind of human experience that there has been in this space is sort of somehow, there are traces of it because 
in the Scottish landscape, you see this kind of evidence of Pictish carvings or Celtic, you know, um, remains. And at the top of the painted hanging, there are these figures of ghosts, and they're like the, the witnesses almost that have been there all the time that see all the things that have happened. And then these women sort of guide through the space, they're climbing through rocks, or they're looking into pools, or they're alongside mountains, and they're climbing through the place, the space, trying to figure out how do we, um, how do we sort of move forwards? How do we, what, what do we do now? And also there, there are images of um, Celtic birds, which are really abstract kind of forms. And the women are sort of either finding these forms or they're moving through them. And the last panel says, let poets let poets speak and um, listen to unfamiliar voices and it's it's really about the ways that human culture develops and the things that we believe in at certain points in time as truths being just part of a construct of our our time and things that were in the past sometimes are, are, are incomprehensible to us because we don't we don't understand the logic of them but that doesn't mean that they didn't seem like truths at the time. So it's really about, it was sort of referencing a little bit this post-truth environment that we were living in. And also this kind of strangeness of what it meant to be outside, what it meant to be gathering information sort of through this pandemic time and how, how we knew and understood things. There's something really beautiful I found in thinking about that post that exploration of post-truth um, through landscape, through something that is so solid and so permanent and so true um, mm -hmm. um, as the kind of site to, to, to put these women and their explorations on top of. Yeah, because also there's something about the sort of permanence of a place of uh, landmarks of a stone, a rock, a kind of landscape like that. But also you see the traces of how it's been used. So you see these kinds of differences in a landscape, you know, a sort of trail or a track that's kind of carved out by its use by animal, or animals or people. And the idea that these women are sometimes trying to cling on to something because they're in grief. They're trying to like hold on to a rock, for example, and it's like, you you have to keep moving because you're still alive whereas these kind of place markers they stay in place because they may be they mark the place where some someone's buried maybe but you as a living person have to keep moving you can't you can't stay still and this uh so you know you see that quite often in my work that there's this sense of this flux or this movement there's always something sort of a little bit volatile in terms of you know the space and there's always movement in it and the thing in in a way the the thing about grief is that it's a really it's a really interesting uh emotion and um in this sense in the sense of a set of histories which have you know they've ended and then you know we have to keep moving on it's it's as if you know grief is like this kind of ongoing state you know we'll always re-meet um and it also there's something about this idea of lamenting and and at the same time I had the, the animation I made an animation and the sound of the animation was playing in the space so the, the animation is called keening so keening songs and keening songs are the songs that these professional mourners the keeners would that they kind of they're not necessarily melodic, but they're lamentations that um, are supposed to help the person who's died move from this world to the next. But they also help the family sort of begin to experience their grief, begin to encounter their grief. And so I, I made these four animations, which are have a they're sort of is episodic and you see these different figures from this imagined group of women and they're coming to terms with different kinds of losses but they're also projecting a hopefulness about what could be what could be constructed as a future and in one 
part one episode, they climb into this stone-like head of death. And while they're exploring inside there, they realize, oh, we, you know, we're still alive. So we can't, we can't stay in this place, which is about death. We have to, you know, everything's still moving. The, the, you know, the sun's coming up and we, we still have to, you know, stay alive and continue. Um, but this, yeah, the, the sound being in the space made a sort of atmosphere in the space as well, so that you heard these kinds of, um, there was this digital sound, but it was my own voice making these sorts of lamentations. Something really hopeful about it, I, I, I think like amidst all of the, the melancholy in the yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. Working was in the world, was, is in the world. Um, but something about the the soundtrack, particularly in the animation, felt like um, a proposition for a new way of thinking about the future. Like that bottom slide, your tomorrow is being constructed. Um, yeah, <clears throat> because also um, there's something that, uh, an essay that Arundhati Roy wrote during the pandemic, and she said, you can uh, you can see the pandemic as a kind of train crash, and you can you can look at it, and you can you can look at the parts of the wreckage, and you can say how can we rebuild this engine so that it's exactly as it was, or you can say what would we build? What do we build next? You know what do we do? And I I had a sense that you know the pandemic did offer us a little or, or rather lockdowns during the pandemic offered us this kind of pause in which we could really consider how we could be living or how we would want to be living or how, you know, what, what we thought would be appropriate ways of moving forwards. And I, I actually think we sort of snapped back quite quickly to what we were used to. But at the time it felt like, you know, despite the sort of shock and the real grief that people were experiencing for those people that lost family members or lost close people, um, there, there was also a sense of a kind of hopefulness that, you know, there is potential for change. There is potential for, for things to be different. And that hopefulness I think is, really important you know for me in the work I want there to be these sorts of sense of real feelings and and there can be sadness or there can be you know lamenting or whatever but there also has to be this sense of potential and hopefulness is potential I guess. I wanted to talk a bit more about um, your work in animation because the not that I, I don't think we should dwell too much on COVID and the lockdowns, but I know that that was the time that you started working with animation and um, I, that was a really interesting departure for me, or departure, not departure, evolution for me as someone who had followed your work, mm -hmm. exciting that you were making your paintings move and giving them soundtracks. Yeah, because I think I had wanted to make animation, but I always imagined, oh, this is going to take me too long to learn how to do it. I won't have time to do it. And then I had this sort of enforced period of time. And I also, I got two sons and they were, at the time they came back home because they were at university. And when I said to them, I really want to make animation, they just said, just, you know, look up tutorials on YouTube and teach yourself as if it, you know, really casually. And it made me, <laughs> it made me think, oh yeah, I can, I actually can try to do this. And so I started doing it and finding that what it offered me that I really liked was this potential that you could go into the world of my drawings because, you know, drawing is something that I do as a way of seeing ideas. And it's something that I do quite sort of continually in my work. But uh, the idea that you, that I could kind of construct a, a kind of bigger space of that kind of imagined drawn space. And then I could sort of allow the viewer to almost like walk around in there or move around in there was like really exciting. And then I could do things like, you know, take elements of drawings and collage them together to make these environments. Um, but the only thing about 
making an animation that's completely different than the thinking for say bigger paintings is animation is really linear because you have frame by frame you move all the the way I did it the way I do it is like you move elements frame by frame it's really laborious but because it's linear I had to think really carefully about how does this scene become this scene you know what's the joining part how does this figure go from here to here because they can't just walk through like a, a straight line and it made it it sort of demanded that I had to be quite inventive about how a figure, for example, moves from one space to another. They might go into something or disappear through a hole or, you know, there were, there were lots of kind of um, challenges in terms of how you maintain a, conti a continuous uh, movement in a linear format. Um, and, then, and then because it's so slow and laborious to make, making the soundtrack is really fun because it, I had the animation and then I just sort of play along with a you know digital software just play along with the image to create the sound kind of atmosphere and that seems very fast and immediate so for me that's what brings it all together and then it feels like something I'm excited about. Um, I think we should talk so, I mean, I mean, this was something, how could you not feel excited about? Um, and I remember this was, I think the first time I saw you after after lockdown and you can see there's hardly anybody in the street. So this is Piccadilly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this really incredible project that um, that was an animation based on uh, the German Benedictine visionary Hildegard of Bingen. Is that right? One, there are four animations. It's called Four Visions for a Hopeful Future. And there are four very short animations and they were shown on rotation every evening for a month on this very big screen at Piccadilly Circus. And um, the last one has the, these images of a bird that has a female head that has a kind of uh, image which is like a, a sort of an image of a song that comes out of their their mouth and when they appear you hear an excerpt of Hildegard von Bingen a piece of music that she wrote because she's like a an incredible visionary and abbess from Germany and she was she was born in 1098 which is like hardly imaginable <laughs> but um the, what I was interested in is there are there are four four episodes and they really sort of pinpoint this moment in time they and the one with the sound of Hildegard von Bingen is the last one and it's a chorus of people that come together and there were these sort of voices that might not be heard that then are listened to and really it was about this idea of um, how we can connect with human activity from many, many years ago when there's someone visionary in their time and they make something or they do something which stays after they're, they're not here anymore. And we're still conscious of their work. I, I just think that is incredible how, you know, sometimes there are voices that, you know, for periods of time, they might be lost, they might not be uh, popular or known, and then they kind of re-emerge. Um, and then the other animations were, the first one was about a kind of, um, a woman who is staring down into a dark pit, which is the dark web, or she's looking up at pinpoints of stars. So she's sort of between this kind of uh, sense of despair and hopefulness. And then she goes into a hermit's cave and she paints all the walls of the cave and then there's spring and she comes out and it says, you know, get ready to heal. And there's another which is, you know, what is a city when there's no one in it? And questions about, you know, are you inside or outside of these reflective edifices? And do you see yourself reflected in the city? Or are you like a sleeping partner who 
you know, contributes to the life of the city, but they don't get to make any decisions or, you know, so they kind of asked different questions about uh, our, our contemporary situation, but they also drew into them these sorts of quite mythical ideas or um, imaginary ideas that kind of made them more into um, stories, I guess, on just sort of open narratives. And then the other thing about them that I, I mean, to be honest, I was really, really nervous just before we showed the first one because you can't try it out beforehand. So it's, you know, you've made this digital file and you really hope that it it looks good. And, and luckily it was fine. But the, um, you can see from that slide that we just had that the materiality of the paper, of the drawings, I'd sort of photographed some of the drawings in a way so that you really saw the materiality of the paper and the ways that the narratives were um, constructed were really sort of open and um, inventive. And I liked the fact that they occupied this space that was usually used for advertising. So they were doing something quite different, like telling our, our stories or telling stories um, in quite different ways and the way that the text operated and the way that you saw, you could you could connect to the sound remotely if you wanted to. Um, I just I just thought there was something really magical about being able to see the work in this space um, in this way. I completely agree. It felt like it felt like um, when you were talking before about how lockdown offered us potentials for thinking about building the world differently. That this yeah, is a very small example of that, but um, but one that uh, could be pursued. Yeah, because you couldn't go into, you know, you couldn't go inside a museum or you couldn't go into a gallery or you couldn't, and, then, and then at some point, probably loads of artists felt really similar. You, you know, at the beginning of all of that, you just thought, what does art do? And, you know, what's it for and how, what do I do and what does it do? And I, I really felt like, you know, sharing stories was something that at the time I felt was reinforced you know, in that period of time, that there were ways that we could share and communicate with each other that became very sort of experimental and interesting. And uh, the use of animation for me was a way of, a way of kind of somehow communicating ideas because I started just doing it on Instagram, just putting it on Instagram, just to show people, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, there were invitations to do projects like this or a project with Hayward Gallery which was a projection of an animation. Um, I am conscious of time. Uh, so oh. we... Yeah. Or, or maybe just less than before the Q&A. So um, I think we should talk, should definitely talk about the Whitechapel. Yeah. Uh, uh, Max Mara project. Um, yeah. I also wanted to talk a little bit more generally about your work and your use of materials and text but we'll come to that um I think the Whitechapel project for me felt like it was much more explicitly about feminism um mm. maybe through the nature of the prize uh being a prize yeah. for but it, it was a project that through which you looked at the treatment of women particularly older women and began mm. as Limped painting Three Ages of Woman, um, which is held at the National Gallery in Rome. Yeah. Um, begin with how, yeah. Um, how and why that painting engendered the project. I, I had to try and encapsulate something quite complicated in a really short amount of time to explain it, but um, the paint, can we see the painting? The painting um, was bought by the National Gallery in Rome to celebrate 50 years of the unification of Italy. And that is a very strange image to uh, celebrate the idea of a nation. And through that lens, when I looked at the painting, not only was I really horrified at the sort of way that the elderly woman was depicted because it seemed so um, analytically observational and 
really in a contrast with the sort of the stylized beauty of the younger woman it just seems like more than ever you're, you're confronted with something which you don't often see in imagery uh, a naked elderly woman and it's as if she's in a state of shame and I thought uh, really briefly that in through the lens of um, the unification of, of Italy the sort of beginning of a new nation there was a sort of modernist idea that the younger woman and the baby represented you know the purity of the, the modernist project this kind of idea of a, a new nation um, allied to a kind of um, to the church but also um, this sort of pure space which was also to do with um, modern science and kind of you know this this idea of how things could be in the future and in doing in in preferencing that you could imagine that the elderly woman represents old traditions old relationships with the the earth with nature old practices and superstitions and ways of being that might be su suppressed in in the kind of search for a kind of new nation and so I thought it's really interesting that in our period of time in order to survive we're turning to these older practices and trying to build sort of greater relationships with nature that pick up on sort of ancient practices and ancient ways, ways of doing things and traditions that uh, might have been lost. Um, and I, so I, I had like two, two things I wanted to do. I wanted to take this elderly woman as a protagonist and instead of her being a sort of sh shameful figure, I wanted to make her the person who had the most agency. And then I wanted to make her a sort of future survivor because I thought if she has the most agency, what is it that she can do? And I thought she can survive in a kind of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic future. And if she does that, then for, for the Max Mara Prize, you, if you're nominated, you, you're asked, you're invited to make a proposal. And the proposal is for a residency where you in Italy where you researched for six months and then you have six months to make the work for the show and I thought I, want, I really want to go to a permaculture site on Mount Etna because Mount Etna seemed to me to be this sort of very inhospitable uh, terrain in which you know it seemed impossible to grow things I was actually it's not it's, it can be a very rich environment but a, a volatile space in which this woman has to try and survive. And there are 12 principles of permaculture and I stayed with a family who'd built their own house. And I wanted to uh, show this woman doing all these things, all, all these acts of survival and demonstrate her as a kind of um, hero, if you like, an unlikely hero. And there are two painted hangings. There's one that is like this sort of volcanic landscape and the other one is a landscape of ruins. So it depicts columns from the ruined temple of, Her the temple of Hercules, which is in Agrigento, which is in uh, Sicily. And it also has one of the columns from the Whitechapel Gallery in it as a kind of idea as the, of these kinds of structures that over time then can be uh, you know, things that are, are kind of in place can then become things that were in place, if you see what I mean. And um, so the, that's one part of it, this idea of her as a survivor. And the other part of it is that Ursula K. Le Guin wrote uh, an essay called The Carrier Bag Theory. And she wrote about hero stories as a kind of linear trajectory, like throwing a spear and killing a mammoth being this big dramatic event she said this is like a hero story and meanwhile there were people um, who were gathering and collecting and doing kind of things sharing and doing things together and those stories didn't get told because they're not the big dramatic hero story and uh, I thought the the most evident well-known hero story is the story of Hercules and I thought it would be really interesting if the elderly woman re-performed the 12 trials of Hercules because she would be performing a hero story. But I just thought 
it, you know, the way that Hercules resolved those trials was through aggression, really aggressive acts like killing and stealing and capturing and uh, colonizing and so on. And I thought an elderly woman would come at that that set of problems in a completely different way and maybe a benevolent caring way and for me it seemed like a really exciting set of thought experiments to ally each trial with a contemporary issue and demonstrate in an animation how the elderly woman would rethink the issue and provide a sort of um a way of thinking through the problem to propose a set of solutions. So it, these are stills from the animation. Uh, there are 12 parts because there are 12 trials and then there's also an introductory part where you see the elderly woman in comparison to these Hercules figures, which is also part of why I researched in Rome. It's like all the different uh, versions of the representations of Hercules. And you see um, the Nimian lion where, you know, the lion skin was used as Hercules' armor. And you see the, the woman and the lion in one of those stills. And that was really about representation and how your image can be um, co-opted into being something that represents something else. Or you, uh, you know, quite often it is the case that minorities are represented in a way that isn't their own representation. And uh, the Nimian lion skin being used as a kind of protection for, for the hero, Hercules, is like a really good sort of metaphor for that. Um, and then there's also the um, Algian stables that Hercules had to clean. And that was reimagined as this kind of really, really problematic situation with energy where we get our energy from what kinds of energy we use how you know that affects us ecologically but also how it, it is the, the sort of site of uh, um, conflict um, and the elderly woman confronts that and proposes different ways of structuring things and then there's also uh, an image there from um, the Garden of Hesperides, where Hercules had to steal golden apples, but it's actually changed into uh, a story of women's reproduction and the woman standing in an ovary, and you see this sort of egg developing, and you know she's protecting uh, women's reproductive rights. So they're they're very um, prescient uh, issues of our time. But you always see this elderly woman kind of thinking her way through it and trying to sort of support and um, make a kind of fairer uh, response, I think, to these issues. Um, I am conscious of time, but I think there are so many important things to think about with this work and um, the whole body. Of um, but maybe just whilst we're here on on these slides and um, we can see text and we can see the figures, I wanted to just, which exists throughout your work, I wanted to just ask um, to ask you about your use of text um, and where it comes from. And I, I know that sometimes it's your own writing and maybe in earlier works it was taken mm. from in some poetry and prose that you've been reading. Um, and yeah. also the way that you paint on on these unstretched uh, when they're shown silks uh, mm -hmm. and what silk offers for you um, over canvas, over stretched canvas, and I know I've you've talked to me about and we've talked about Ellen Sisu's um, women's writing and and thinking about your painting as a form of feminist. Mm -hmm. art. Um, that's a very big last question. But... So many things. Yeah, um, it would be maybe quite nice if we just like flick through some of the images while I um, answer that. I think the thing about um, Ellen Sixu, okay, the, te the text that I use is now my own writing and it's a way of, I think, 
what I'm trying to do in my work is capture the way we think. So we operate emotionally and logically and we remember and we project all simultaneously. And sometimes thoughts are really verbal and they come out as a kind of, yeah, a verbal structure and sometimes they're images. And for me, it's like piecing together all these elements of human thinking in order to try to represent in some way, you know, what my experience is as a human. And um, so the texts are quite sort of short, small texts, and they quite often ask questions. And it's like, you know, it might be in my mind that I'm asking myself things. Um, and then the thing about Ellen Siksu is the text actually that was really important to me. Um, I really want to be careful to say, I don't frame my work through the sort of lens of second wave feminist thinking. I My work is really exploratory and what I reference changes all the time, depending on what I'm doing. But this essay coming to writing by Ellen Siksu was really fundamental to me because it's a beautiful essay. And also because she asks, you know, do I have the right to write? And it really, for me, mirrored the experience of thinking about making art and what, how would I make art? Do I have the right to say I'm an artist? And all of those kinds of doubts and questions about the company, the And they say that really, it, as an artist, and it articulated them really, really well. And so it became a sort of seminal text for me. And one of the things that it, it um, showed me was that it's up to you to, um, to articulate your own thinking in your own way. And you, you can do that. And it's uh, possible to, you know, to formulate a kind of language or a way of saying what it is you want to say or communicate. And that, you know, that includes visual. And um, it it felt like something really important to me because I felt quite often that as I stepped into the way that I'm I make my work, it felt like I um, I was doing something that felt like it, it became more and more really my own space, it's like a sort of space that I can go into to think and explore. And the fact that I started painting on silk felt like. I was making a lot of drawings on handmade paper and I wanted to find a sort of equivalent surface. And I just, I thought the thing about silk is you, you know, I could paint on it, but I say I can shape it, I can cut it, I can, and it's not a sort of regular rectangular thing. It can be uh, very sort of um, flexible. And it's very light. So when it's um, installed as a hanging, it feels like it's sort of, moves a little bit like it's sort of breathing a little bit I don't know it's got this real lightness to it which is like the lightness of thinking or speaking I I really liked it its qualities um and then yeah it seemed like it, it kind of the the materiality of the way I could make my work just felt really appropriate to the sorts of subjects of the work and it felt like a over time, I could build something that really felt like it was it was mine in the in the sense that that's my way of exploring these things. Thank you, thanks, Emma. That was a very eloquent. Perception. Thank you. Question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just um, go through the rest of the slides, and then I'll stop sharing the screen, and we'll open up. The question. Okay, so I think we have about just over 10 minutes. Um, so the first question was, can you talk about the writing in your work, which I think we've, I'd, I'd say we've answered, um, mm -hmm. is uh, a great one. What made you want to become an artist? Um, I think I I spent a lot of time when I was a kid drawing and drawing was a space that 
I could just do what I wanted. I could make anything I wanted happen in drawing. So I could just imagine something and draw it. And it's as if it, it felt like a really um, um, sort of a really great space, you know, full of potential. And then I sort of lost that way of drawing for a long time. But I always wanted, I felt like I wanted to make art. I wanted to make things. I don't know. I really sort of don't have any moment that I thought uh, I'll change direction and become an artist it felt like it just feels like it was a part of me uh, and something that I needed to do and at one point in my life I really had a crisis and thought maybe I'm not an artist and then what I did was start making drawings so it's as if <laughs> it's my solution to everything is to make something even you know just for myself it just feels like a part a part it is something it gives me something that other things can't give me like a space for thinking that no other activity gives me so um, i'm glad you have it <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to combine two questions here so um there's a question about who are the artists historical and contemporary that you most admire and another question that asks whether so the, the 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 person asking the question says the panels recall Blake Blake's illustrations and paintings and she wonders if Blake is an influence um no Blake isn't uh, an influence um I mean obviously I've, I've looked at Blake but I there was a time when I was in Amsterdam and Rudy Fuchs the curator it's like very well respected curator I met him and he quoted to me a, a line from Blake and I wasn't familiar with it and I felt like oh I you know this is something I should have looked at more closely and I do see I see why people make this connection but it's not it's not something that I have made myself um and as for artists um just off the top of my head, because it's, it's always kind of a bit difficult being put on a spot like this. I absolutely love Carol Rama, who's an Italian artist who came from Turin. I saw a, a, a retrospective of her work at the New Museum in New York a few years ago. And I really, I think her work's extraordinary and really amazing. And a contemporary artist that I really love is Erika Versuti. I love her work. I think it's really, I saw her show at the Pompidou twice. I, and I think it's really exciting work. But having said that, I think artists that interest me, it's like it's something that's changing all the time. You know, it's something that you're, you're sort of in and out all the time of looking at all different things. So it isn't fixed, like, you know, there's always one thing or just changes a lot. I think I see there's like a similarity with you and Erica Rizzuti in, in imagining through materials and nature, imagining a different future. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I just, I, I really like the sort of obscurity somehow of um, some of the things that she makes and how sort of ancient and alien they seem as well as being con completely contemporary and that that kind of thing excites me you know I am I see that mm. there is here's another question um are the texts derived at through the laying out of the painting itself seeing the image become organized or does the text get inserted very fairly intuitively or maybe it enters much later how spontaneous and unpredictable is the painting? Um, there's a kind of level of spontaneity because usually I have maybe a few drawings that give me a sense of what it is I'm going to make. But most of it, I don't really know too much about. I just find it out as I'm making it. And then I have a similar thing where sometimes there's a text that I've already written down that I know I'm going to use. And other times I know there's a space here and there will be a text here, but I will paint it in 
once I've kind of really formulated what it is and I'm sort of half doing that while well, maybe I'm painting something else. Um, or sometimes I'm kind of writing something and trying to edit it down to be like a really short text, but um, it, it isn't sort of strictly one way. It's like, it is quite organic how the work happens. Um, yeah, just do, it just really depends on, on the work. Um, and, and then there was the, the bit that I think also feeds into another question about um, your process, physically speaking, for producing the large works on silk. And the other part of that question was about how spontaneous and unpredictable. So um, I guess, do you sketch onto the silk? How do you? No, you, the, the thing about the silk is that if you make a mark on it, you just, you can't take it off. So it's all quite immediate. And I like that because I think it's really like drawing on paper. You know, if you make a drawing on a piece of paper, it's not like you can take the mark away if you use, say, paint. Um, so what happens is with the very big, I think we saw some images of the Kindle exhibition in Berlin where the painted hangings are like 10 meters by 14 meters. So they're really big. And for something like that, there's a, a sort of plan, like a loose drawing that's a plan of how it will be. And then they're made in sections and, um, they're kind of um, a sort of, you know, leave open this space for, for spontaneity in the sense that it, you know, I think I would be bored if I was remaking something that I'd already decided everything about. But with the silk, it's like, you, you know, you, yeah, it's very, very immediate. And so it sort of, um, it feels like it has this, sort of speed of things being put together that is as close as I can get to keeping the sense of what it's like to make a drawing but then you know making it big scale and there's all these elements that are like uh, the logistics of doing that how it's going to get put together or how it will be hung and all of those things that I have to keep in mind you know but not get sort of uptight <laughs> about <laughs> it you know stay stay open I think we probably have time for just uh two more um the first being what advice do you have for aspiring artists um I always think when, when people I've been asked a number of times about advice and I was thinking about my <laughs> One of my sons, when he was younger, he always used to say to me, keep going, mom. And I used to think that's the best advice you could have is just like, keep, keep going, with, you know, the thing that you're doing, keep going. Because like how, how you make your work is really going to be up to you. You know, it's got to suit you and who you are. And what happens with it and, you know, those sorts of mechanics of the art world are, you know, you can't, you couldn't necessarily directly advise about how that might be for anyone uh, or presume to sort of know. <laughs> but um, I think the thing about making work is that it, it's a thing that you sort of, in my experience, you dedicate yourself to it and you find the space that opens up that makes you believe that you really want to keep doing it. And if you have that relationship with it, then all the other things about, you know, showing it to people or talking about it to people or whatever seems so much easier because uh, you're in it. Yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful advice. I don't know. Going. Um, the last question, I, and I should also say there are lots of thank yous and um Emma appreciation within this Q&A. Oh, thanks. That's nice. But the, so the last one says, thank you for your wonderful work. I've been inspired by your practice for many years. Two questions. I think we've answered the first. Um, that's my interjection. 
you mentioned realizing that there is a recent revisiting in contemporary work to old methods. Would you say mm. that your use of politics is related to this revisiting? Um, would I say that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. But... Would you say that your use of fabrics is related to this revisiting? Which I think we've kind of answered. But the second question, putting a pillar in place, not in place, is this you marvelously suggesting that institutions should be dismantled? Uh, it's, it's the way of saying that things don't have to be how they always have been. Um, you know, that things aren't um, set in stone in that, in that respect. There's potential for change. It's, it's saying that. I mean, the thing about that space in the Whitechapel Gallery is... Uh, if you went in there, um, you might see that the, the pillars in that space are very sort of dominant. They're there, they're very visible. It's something you notice about the space. And I wanted to install the hangings so that you weren't so aware of them, that, that it kind of reordered the way that you experience the space. And that is a kind of, um, yeah, maybe a gentle way of suggesting <laughs> there are there could be other ways. And, you know, I think I said earlier, that's that's a question that reoccurs in my work all the time, which is like, they, do you think there could be another way? And I sort to like it like that, left open like a question rather than an instruction or <laughs> something destructive. I'm not necessarily after that. Mm -hmm. I think that is a perfect place to end. Um, Thank you so much, Emma. Oh, thank you. Thank you for guiding me through, Laura. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> and you.